Hello and welcome to Women of Worth Wednesday. I am so grateful for all of you that are joining in live. We have a very special treat today. We are with the one and the only, probably not the only, right? There's probably other Michael McClellans, but not you. Thank you. That's great. <laughs> The one and only Michael McLean, and I am just so grateful um, for this opportunity to have a conversation because I feel like you have been the song of my life in the background. That's great. And there's not a December that happens that you're not a part of our December as well because of Forgotten Carols and Mr. Cooper's Christmas. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if I can claim being the biggest Jimmy Stewart fan, but... Um, you can't be me. I. This is what I'm saying. You and me and T.C. Christensen, I think we're the three that are big, <laughs> are in charge of that club. And so thank you. Thank you for giving us a few minutes here at Women of Worth. Um, for those that are regular parts of this little family on High Five Life, we, we rarely have male guests come, but we're always grateful because... We, um, we're all one big family, and, and we like to share messages from women about women, but I also feel like you, you have a unique perspective on the world and on, on this um, time of season of year that we're going into with the holidays. And I think specifically Forgotten Carols is a beautiful story about a woman and her journey. And so I, I'll find any reason to sit down and talk with you. So I'm grateful this day is here. Um, First and foremost, I just, I think one of the things that has been on my heart is as a writer and, and a creator, that whole process of creation is, is kind of crazy to kind of have the well full enough to be always in creation mode. And I haven't told you this, we have a mutual friend, Jeanette Bennett is a good friend of mine. And when we first met, she told me advice that she had gotten from you. And it helps me every single week. And so this is the takeaway. I'm going to share on Women of Worth, cool. and then everything's going to be... Great. Yes. She said, Michael McClain taught me the greatest thing, because she's a writer, and she's always producing magazines. Fabulous. Yeah, she's fabulous. Um, and, and I always kind of have a book deadline or a speaking event I'm prepping for or something. But I'm also trying to like balance the family life and the other to-dos that we all have. She says, Michael McLean taught me a trick. She says, he tells Heavenly Father to start working on what he needs to work on. It makes me emotional talking about it because it has blessed me so much the last few evenings. And you tell Heavenly Father, listen, I've got to work on that in a couple of weeks. But I need it to be worked on while I'm doing this other stuff. Yes. Is not that the most brilliant thing? Ruby's going to join us here. I have a Ruby dog and Michael has a Ruby dog. Um, and that has been such a blessing to me that she learned from you and then she talked to me and this helped me with anxiety, with frustrations, when I'm worried like, am I going to make that? Is it going to be able to? And turning it over to Heavenly Father and saying, listen, can you work on that? Because this week I've got this going on, but I've got an appointment with you and when we show up, I'm ready for the download. That's great. Well, and that's how um, the Forgotten Carols came, came to be. Because what happened was I had written some songs and uh, Desert Book, who released it, um, this was way back in 1991. And it was the 6th of April. And they said, look, there's no way you're going to get this out for this Christmas because we would have to have everything the book written to give to the board of directors to review it in seven days. And I didn't have a book. I had some songs and kind of an idea. And I, and I had a full-time job and I had three little kids. And so, um, and the way I was introduced to this is that uh, I've been in therapy for a long time because of my um, issues with depression and other things. And, and I was talking to my counselor and my therapist and I was saying, oh man, it's too bad because it would be really cool if this idea of a book could a, manifest a, a, and some songs and all that other stuff. And he said, well, let your creative unconscious do the work. I said, what are you talking about? He told me about this book. And he said, you know, you're always working. You're just not conscious all the time. So I said, what do you mean? He said, well, and he told me about this book about a guy who had said, I'm going to let all this work happen while I'm oh. asleep because I can't do any more. Wow. So what happened is, I, here's the way it worked. I would 
get ready to go. I had to be at work at by 9.30. So um, I'd get up at about six, and um, but the night before I had sat down and started to write the ideas, and then I'd say, look, I have got to go to sleep. So could you work on this? Whatever, whatever creativity, whatever part of it, whatever subconscious thing, whether it's God Almighty or just the creative muse or whatever you call it. Or your higher power. Or whatever. Yeah, whatever it is that you want to call that. Um, to go to work. Here, and here's what I need. And then I would get up in the morning at 6 and I'd make it like it was an appointment. Like this. Like yes. together. And I'd say, yes. so what have you got? Exactly. Boom, 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 boom. And then it would be time to go to work. Yeah. And I'd say, look, I have got to do my job or I can't pay the light bill. So between now and when I get back and put the kids to bed, I need you to, this is what I think in chapter two we should be working on, uh, and I'll see you later. And I just completely put it out of my mind. Then I'd get back, put the kids to bed, kiss, kiss, and I'd say, thanks, so thank you for all this work you've been doing while I've been having to do something else, and don't worry about editing, I'll take that, just let's go. And this little book that's Do so you guys hear this? This is so powerful. Millions of, and it was, here's the interesting thing. Um, I got it done in time. I mean, essentially, the this, this story got told. But here's the most fascinating thing for me. This year, after 28 years of promoting the story and doing this live production that keeps evolving. The tour, if you're not familiar. Yeah, I, I do a tour. If you go to ForgottenCarols.com, you can see all the places that will be this year. But after 28 years of taking my story and these songs and putting it on stage, taking it all over the country, I'm changing. I mean, completely reimagining. So if people come this year, they're going to get a different Forgotten Carol story? They're going to get a newly imagined story. Uh -huh. Same characters, same songs. Okay, because you don't want me to start crying about that. Well, here's the. I'll miss that. Well, here's what I think. They're this evolving. is this is what's fascinating to me. I wasn't planning to do this, but if I don't do this, I will regret it forever. I love that. There's something inside. That's saying crazy. There's something that has been, and what I've discovered is, people would ask me, "Don't you get tired of doing this?" And I said, you know, I think I should, but um, I learned something every night. I think, oh, I thought this song Memphis. that I wrote in 1991 was about this. It's not about that. It's about this other thing. But now I have an insight, and it happened with my son Scott, who I wrote this adaptation with, um, that is so powerful to me that I have to share it. You have to share it. Well, and it's kicking my butt because I have to learn all these new lines. I've been in rehearsal since Labor Day. I mean, it's just, and today, right after I see you, we're going down oh. this, the new sets and the new visualization. It's very cinematic. And I'm also taking on the role, in addition of being John, of being the narrator. So I get to tell the story like I did in the very beginning, right, right. but with all these great actors surrounding me and these great choirs and this fabulous uh, visual, it's its going to be stunning. I hope people Well, know. I'm so grateful that you have the courage to create a new layer because our world is evolving, like our needs are evolving, and so I'm, I'm excited to see yeah, I'm either, where the story takes us. I'm either killing the franchise <laughs> or no. reinvigorate. You know, two years ago, right now, two years ago, when I did that, just getting ready to go on that tour, I did the tour, I wasn't feeling great. And after I finished the tour, um, Lynn and I always kind of try to decompress. And we have this little place we go to in Mexico and we just sit on the beach and do nothing. And while we're there two years ago, I say to Lynn, oh, I think I'm dying. And she looks at me, she's an RM, and she says, she rolls her eyes. She says, you always have to be so dramatic about <laughs> Like You're like, I just got off tour. Like I'm everything. A little, a, a little, and she just, she says, just sleep, take a Xanax, do whatever. Yeah. You'll be fine. Well, it turns out I was dying. So I get home from uh, Mexico, and they race me to the emergency room January of two years ago. And um, I had a blood pressure of 220 over 118. My uh, A1C level, because I'm a diabetic, was like through the ceiling. My creatinine level was like stage four kidney failure and 11 other things. So you really were dying. I, 36 hours later, you gone. You would have been gone. 
you wouldn't be having this interview. Or it would be and my really, bucket list. It would be so cool if you had this interview. <laughs> and we I have a special you. spiritual visitor this week for we don't normally women have of worth or but, angels. But he thought but no, uh, Brother McLean felt that um, we are so movie. worth it, he crossed through to do the thing. Hey, so, I'm open for that if anyone's listening. So So, so I have this really dramatic experience. Right. And uh, it wasn't like I, you know, all the people who have near-death experience. Right. It wasn't that that, but it was. I was really sick. And they told me it's going to take a long time for you to heal. And for me, what's that? A week and a half? Have to cancel a couple of concerts? Don't do? No, no, no. Two years. Wow. So I'm just kind of starting to feel better. And last year, I almost canceled the Forgotten Carols tour because I just. They said it takes a long time to get better. And you, you have to say no to things. I'm not good at that. No. You have to say, okay. So anyway, I did the show last year. And then some people in Atlanta were interested in doing, uh, helping fund a movie of this. So my son, Scott, who I adore, he's an actor. He's doing a show right now in uh, Baltimore and as an actor. But I said, let's get this screenplay, do some stuff on screen that we couldn't do on, on stage. stage, yeah. And then we started to talk about this character of John. And Scott said, in the play or and in the book, there's just a little hint. Maybe maybe this is John Monroe. Maybe this guy who claims he's been alive uh, two thousand years. Really is it and, and some people who can see it, because it's not a denominational story, right. it's a Christian story. Maybe, maybe people who have ears to hear me, but they'll say, Ooh, there's a little hint. Maybe this guy is John the Beloved. Or maybe he's just a crazy old man that has magic powers, angel-like at Christmas time. And so we start to say, what if... Oh, and he uses, in the story, as you know, little tricks to get Constance to... It, it, it isn't complete evil deception, but he has to kind of sneak her in so that he can bless her with these songs that she needs. Right. What if it isn't... What if we tell this story about those two but what if it isn't in 1970? What if Constance's dad didn't die in World War II? What if she's 2019? What if it's right now? And her dad died in Desert Storm? And what if John, instead of finding clever ways to get people, the homeless guy that gets sneaks into houses and tries to what if he really is? Mm. And and what if from the get-go, what if you say like PTSD? Let, no, let's just let's just have the John character not hide anything. Oh, and, and so we started to ask questions like, well, if this guy is John the Beloved, well, why doesn't he look like he's 30? Mm -hmm. Why didn't Jesus just say, poof, yeah. you can live until I come back, but you'll just look, look like awesome forever. And then I can't play it because I can't look awesome forever. Then you're out of and so and so we thought, or Anyway, I don't want to give too much away because it's just well, so Well, now typical. you're peak. Now you all think that you've already seen, but you've got to... Yeah, you got to see it. It's it, uh, it, And... Do you tackle a new subject line or issues? Can you give us a teaser on what may be relevant to what we're facing? Because the work right oh, now, my sister took her life five years ago, so I do a lot of work in that area. And, and I think holidays can be an interesting mix bag of emotions and so I think I love Forgotten Carols because it I think it taps into all those emotions I don't think you shy away from the shadows of the light right but is there any teaser you can give us on well here's what's happened um, somebody asked me on an interview I had the other day um, what's changed the most now, we don't want you to give it away because it was yeah. a specific Thing. radio interview for a place and I didn't want people to say well I heard all about that yeah. or well I'm not Right, right. How dare you change my right. tradition? Yeah. But um, what's changed the most is I have changed. I love that. And what when I played this character for 28 years of John, is he really John the Beloved or is he just a crazy old guy? I felt like these songs that were teaching me so much, mm -hmm. that this very wise 2,000-year-old man who knew Jesus, had come to Constance with the perfectly chosen songs that relate to her life, stories that relate to her life, to help her 
who was so close to he knew her so yes. personally. And, and the metaphor was that Jesus knows us so personally so that he will give us the gifts, and as his representative, it will be just what she needs. So I'm thinking, for years, that's the role of the great leaders, to know it all, and then change, change. Because we're all changing. What if, what if the real message, what if, and the reason I started thinking about this, my dad uh, died of Alzheimer's, and I had dementia and became Alzheimer's. And, you and sh are you going to share the great story of him and his? Not now. Okay. <laughs> could, You're going to have to Google that. No, no, no. I, <laughs> no, but my dad has, so I, we took care of my mom and dad and Lynn's mom and dad in this house wow. for a number of years, and they were sick and dying and difficult but and then of course some of the brethren have had dementia mm -hmm. the prophet uh, Tom Monson was just you know it, it happens when you get older we all right what if what if what if John what if John has a little dementia what if he's thought said you know I was really sharp until the 1700s when I'm going downhill I I think Jesus must be coming soon I think he's coming back soon, and there's something I'm supposed to tell you, and I can't remember what it is, but my heart says I, I'm supposed to, I'm not exactly how, sure how this will work out. I don't know everything, but I have learned my whole life to trust this feeling. And this is, he's telling this to a woman who has no feelings. Who's she's complete, off she's completely yeah. shut down. Yeah. Prayer is not on her list. Right. And so instead of me playing this and this completely reimagined story as a how can I find the most adorable way to do what you need? I know, I know what you need. I'm inspired to know what you need, and I will present it in a way that I think you need it. What if it's not that? What if the way we help each other and bless each other is to say, I don't know what's going on. I'm not going to tell you what to do, but I think I'm supposed to share this, and I think we'll figure it out together. Because you know what? I need what you need, which is I need Jesus every day. I love that because I think one of the things that, especially for this community, um, and all of our relationships, right, especially in parenting, and I know you've shared some of your own faith journey and parenting journey, is that we want to fix. We want to Of course. Our, yeah. We don't want to just show up and be together and love by just being present. We want the solution. We want the answer. We want to take the pain away. And so what a beautiful idea of saying maybe all that we need to do is journey together as a, a family and show up for each other, and that's enough. I mean, that's what I often say with suicide prevention and, and that I there's only one Savior. I couldn't save Meg. That's right. I can love. I can influence. I can invite, but I can't that's save. That's right. And, and see, that taps into something. One of the things that happens in our culture is we, we sing. I'm trying to be like Jesus. And we want to do what he did. And we want to follow that example. We but, but we're not Jesus. And Jesus plays this role that only he could play. Right. And our role is to remind each other. Who he was. We all need him 24-7. Yep. And the, oh, we have, there's a new song that opens the show. And, and we start our Christmas story in the spring. And we see John, who spends an entire year singing a Christmas song called 1225, which is Christmas Day, 365, that he sings to people, we need to have him born in our hearts every day. Every day. That for him, every day's got to be Christmas. Hey, listen, I hope my family's watching, because I listen to Christmas music all year long, and they get irritated at me, and I say, I need Christmas, I need eyes on Jesus every day. That's right. Come eyes to, on Jesus. You've got to gotta come to oh, this Oh, I'm going to be there. I I'm hope afraid. you all will will find a, a show near you. And if not, um, what, what I also love is more recently you've shared your own faith experience of feeling like the heaven's head shut. That your prayers- Oh, my faith crisis, yeah, yeah, nine years. Yeah, and some people are, nine years, yeah. That the, that the windows of heaven had closed, that God wasn't interested or there or aware and I think for for our audience I think that's such a common human experience but you've put a very public story behind that and I love that you were willing to say listen I didn't know if it was this or this and this was kind of the breaking point and was God ever going to talk to me again 
I, I love that you shared that looking back hindsight wise, you saw that he was there, that you had been there. But for this audience, what would you say if you're in the middle of the nine years? What do you do to not give up hope? Because of, especially if you deal with chronic depression and anxiety, right? That becomes the wall. So the people loving you and the spirit of God is struggling to get through that. And, and I get messages every day, thousands of them, of people that say, I hear you, I read your messages, you're saying hold on, that, you're, that I'm needed. But what, what, what did you learn after that nine year wilderness experience that, that you could have said to yourself back then, hey, you're in the middle of this, Michael, but? Well, there's nothing you can say. And here's, and here's the problem with my journey. And that is, I made Mr. Kruger's Christmas. That's During that? No, oh. when I was 27 years old, yeah. I stood alone in front of the leaders of our church, yes. First Presidency Quorum of God, alone, 35 minutes, pitched Mr. Kruger's Christmas and said, I will make this film. Give me the money, let me make this film. I'm 27, what do I know? The movie gets made and 300 million people in 10 languages change the way they feel about the church. And then I go on a stretch for 20 years of making commercials for the church, writing and directing films for the church. They didn't have my name on them, but it was from the church. I wrote them, I directed them, I used my songs to be in them. I thought, I know how to, I know how God works. I meet with the prophets. Yeah. The prophets. Oh, yeah. I get special blessings, apostolic blessings. I'm the guy. And I, I didn't feel arrogant about it. I just thought, well, this is my mission. Right. This is what I'm supposed to do. Right. So. When that changes. It, and, and we all kind of want yes. to blackmail God. Yes. We want to say, don't you know what I've done for you? Did you see how righteous I was? Aren't you impressed? Come on. I need help now, and I deserve it. Where is it? Yep. And what happens is we tell each other. We go to meeting. You know, my joke about the 14th article of faith is <laughs> we, we believe, believe in, in meetings with hope for meetings, with endure. There are excuses for meetings. We seek after these excuses. So we go to meetings, and we tell each other what to do. Here's the five steps. You're, you're in the middle of a great crisis. Ah. Here's the five steps or the seven steps or the ten points or the just sit quiet, listen closely. Do these steps. This is what you need to do. And when you do those things and it doesn't work, what's happened is we don't mean to do this to each other. But the first principle of the eternal gospel is not have faith in if you pay tithing, you won't go broke. It's not a cake recipe. No, the, the, it is not you will get this if you do this yeah. because put the ingredients in the bowl stir it up put it in the and then when it comes out and it's flat and it's raw in the middle you're like wait yeah 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 you so, abandoned me exactly and so if you put faith in anything except the only one that we are told to put our faith in anything we're, we're, it, you're you are setting yourself up for the heart well so i'm setting myself up and setting myself up and i go through this great crisis and then I do what I've always done. I pray this way. And yes. you, you remember, I, I made movies for you. I did this great thing for you. I'm a pretty good guy. I'm a worker bee. I'm a worker bee, and I haven't let you down. And I, I'm a word of wisdom virgin. And I, <laughs> you know, I, I, I was worthy when I went to the I mean, all that stuff. So I just want comfort and guidance and direction right. for this crisis that I have. Right. And when it doesn't come, you think, oh, this is a test. This is a test. Oh, I can do a test, right? Oh, let me see how long I have to do this test. And then you think, well, this is too long for this test. It can't be nice. I can't do this anymore. And then the test, if it is a test, gets impossible. Mm -hmm. You know, when, when, when my son Jeff came out and told me he couldn't do it at the church anymore, and he was gay, Which and he was... Which is a common family experience sure, sure. happening right now. And, so. but, and this was years ago. When but, there wasn't maybe the ally support. Hopefully well, so. and what we said about it amongst right. in our tribe yeah. wasn't helpful Culturally. to him. So yeah. he's a return missionary. He says, I just, you lied to me. You were awful. You, you made the most fantastic commercials in the world about how to be a great dad and weren't so great. You weren't. Oh, and can you help me get my name removed from the records of the church? You who devoted your whole life to that Mormon thing. Uh, it doesn't work for me. Uh, and I'm in California, and it's Prop 8. Oh, so I'm, I'm living in Southern California, and I, so I go to church to be told. You're living in Southern California. At the time. So I'm, I go to church, 
where we hear from the pulpit, yes. this is not a civil rights matter. This is the most, Important. this is the biggest moral deal in the world. And if we can't let those gay people get married, then he wants to get married. So you're having this conflict, and then you're getting this feedback from your child, and you're like, wait, I failed at this role that probably is the most important thing. You and if it is the most important thing, then you owe me. Right. This, I, I Look, I gave my life to you. Yes. You owe me. Right. You owe me. Right. And we think God owes us something. We really, you guys, Can, we really, really do. And we try to blackmail him. In our you, if, you, if you don't answer this prayer, I'll show you, I'll yes. just go quit yes. and it feels like it and then and god's like i'm so okay i'm big enough you can be mad at me all day long i still love you yes but when you're in it and here's yes, the thing when, you're in, when it. you're in it when you're in it no matter what anybody says and you bristle a little bit it hurts you a little bit because it's the cliche I, I i just want you to know i get that yeah and it's okay you don't think it's okay, but it's okay. So how did you keep swimming? I was given this great gift. And the great gift was this. I trying to think of a really short way to get to the essence of it so that you can go on with life and this is not too long. You mentioned earlier about that story that I had told about yeah. my dad. Yeah. And, um, I wondered if that was. Yeah, and here's, here's kind of what happened. I, um, Mother Teresa went through this. I know. And she, People and, don't know this. Yeah, and Mother she Teresa. She had this amazing. No, 49, 49 years of 49 crisis. years. 49 years. So she's deeply moved by the Spirit. And then spends her whole life serving God at every level. And she is the face of the Catholic Church. Yes. And she writes to all of the priests that she confessed to. Yes. Destroy this letter. But, by but the I way, don't I think God's abandoned me. What have I done wrong? What do I have to change? I, I, I'm getting the Nobel Prize. I represent. I can't tell anybody because I don't want to hurt their faith. But this has gone on. Not 10 years, not 20 years. This has gone on. And I'm reading this book while I'm in the middle of my faith. And I'm not Mother Teresa, but I'm thinking, oh man, 49 years? How did you do this? And, I, and I'm looking for my own little exit strategy. It is, I'm two years into my faith crisis. I'm not getting answers to my prayers. And I'm thinking, how do I get out? What if I was wrong? What if I bet my life? On the wrong track. What what if I was so arrogant or if this was a career move because they bought my records? How do I get out? There's maybe not even a God. And maybe it isn't just a church thing. It's a what what if it's all wrong? Yeah. So here I am thinking, oh, and it was and i and I'm empty and nothing, nothing I can do. There's it's nothing not, left to pull from. You can't go to the yeah. temple more often than we went. You fast. can't pay enough tithing, you can't fast enough. And then sometimes you'd sit in your church oh. and you'd think I gotta go out in the parking lot and scream I can't do <laughs> this someone talks about their hanging out yeah it's just awful so I'm reading this book in California I'm in Malibu oh, at the time I've read that book come be my light and I'm feeling it and I go to bed and I have a dream and Mother Teresa shows up in my dream now this is not a this is not like Moroni at the edge of the I bed no but God talks to us but, it's, but, but yeah. I'm in my dream yeah. A year earlier, I had been, my musical, The Ark, had been off-Broadway, and, um, and I was in that theater, and Mother Teresa, a young Mother Teresa, shows up in my dream, and I'm sitting at the piano in a theater, and she's singing, and I'm accompanying, this is so weird, I'm com accompanying Mother Teresa, and I think this is weird. The Catholic nun, and the Mormon. Back in the day when we called ourselves yeah, Mormon songwriter. Yeah, previously known as. Previously known. So I'm, and I'm thinking in my dream, how do I know her songs? How do you know her heart? Well, I, I'm not processing that. Okay. I'm just thinking she's singing. I hear a therapist she, in the dream, by the way. <laughs> she's singing to me. She's singing songs that I can accompany, and I'm thinking in my dream, why do I know her songs? I'm not thinking I'm getting analyzed by it. I'm just doing it. Then it comes to the point in the show, and there's an audience watching all of this. And she's going to sing why she didn't quit. 
Why should they tell everybody Catholics are stupid, that God isn't there, I'm throwing in the towel. Why didn't you do that? And I get to accompany her saying why she didn't quit for 49 years, because she's dead, all right? So I start to play and I hear this. She sings, I choose to pray, and I'm playing for her. I choose to pray for one who doesn't hear me. I choose to wait for love he just conceals. And though God's chosen now not to be near me, I'm keeping promises my heart no longer feels. I'm keeping promises. My heart, and I wake up 4 30 in the oh morning and I sob. I'm sobbing because this has nothing to do with Mother Teresa at all. It's your faith, it's my faith. <laughs> and so here I am, and I am thinking, I have to choose. I can't wait anymore. I'm in or out. I'm either going to trust Jesus or not. Yeah. I'm not going to bitch and moan about this anymore <laughs> and shake my fist. Yes. I'm either in or I'm out. And I'm, and, and I'm thinking, so I get on my knees. It's very, I know it's the, like my wife, it's everything I have to do something that. <laughs> so I'm on my knees and I feel like uh, addiction recovery prayer. You right, know? right. God, or whatever. Right, ever. Um, I don't know why you don't want to talk to me. I don't understand why you won't let me be, feel comfort or reassured. I don't know why all the steps that I've made to try to be worthy to feel your presence are not there. I have done this for too long. Um, but I'm making a new covenant. I've been baptized, I've been in the temple, I've been a missionary, I've given my life to helping the church build the kingdom through film and said, Consecrated. I'm starting it all. all over. I consecrated it all. Yeah, and now, here's the deal. I trust you. I'm, from this moment on, going to show up and shut up. I'm going to trust you. This is so hard for me, but I'm going to trust you that when it's right, you'll let me know why it took so long or what I was supposed to learn, but I'm just going to do... And as I'm praying, oh, this is a painful thing to... Shh. Full surrender. No, no, yeah, full surrender, but this is odd. I'm thinking in the back of my mind, this is a really good prayer. <laughs> Man, that, that, this is... this. Bring yes, the camera in. Him. Zoom in. Hey, look at him. Two years and he's making... And I'm thinking, I am thinking while I'm doing this prayer and I'm surrendering to God... This is going to be great. I bet I got seven more weeks. This is over. We want to do this in our lives. Seven more weeks. It's over. It was seven more years. And it got worse. It got worse. Awful things Did happened. you keep returning back to that surrender prayer? Did you keep returning back to that no, cross? No. It was, I finally said, look, it's up to you. So I'm not going to come here and weep. And go, oh, now, you say, why not next week? When I committed that you know what I don't know, I am trusting that you will give me an answer when I'm ready, that I will learn about it, I will be moved by it, but it's all on you now. I'm going to show up. So, you know, I'm going to the temple every week with my wife. I'm going to church here and stuff, and the thing that's really painful. And then we move home from California. Here, it's worse. It's worse. I, I'm, 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 I'm having to ask questions in church, and I'm told, shut up. Don't speak. Bishop comes over here because I had an issue in... in so you're struggling with your community, and you're struggling with your... And, and to bring it full circle, it feels like this is exactly what we started talking about, that you said to God, I can't work on this anymore. You're going to have to work on it, and when you're ready, I'll show up for the download. So, you did exactly the same thing that you told Jeanette that taught me. Yeah. Like, you got to work on it because I'm doing all the blood, sweat, and tears, and it's not working anymore. So you take care of it, and when I show up when it's ready, but then here's, you're going to show up. But here's what I learned. I had determined in my own little brain that I thought was so wonderful. I know how I'll recognize it. You will answer uh, my prayers the way you've always answered them. I know, I know. I made movies for the church. So I know how it shows up. I know how it shows up. That I, closing scene. It, this is the box. This is how you answer prayers. So when I'm put on the board of directors of a Christian, progressive Christian 
peace organization in Chicago. I don't think, well, this God's going to help me. Right here. I'm sitting right next to a gay Catholic priest. He's not going to teach me anything. He's interesting, and I love him. And I don't realize that maybe God said, you know, if you could talk to a gay Catholic priest who'd left the church but have people, that'll help you understand your son better. I'm not seeing that. This wasn't a general conference. This wasn't in the Ensign. This wasn't in a high five interview. Or about, no, 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 no. Women of Worth Wednesdays. Yeah, yeah, it wasn't that. Yeah. Well, it turns out that so many things. Ways God was putting people in your life to help your heart open. But this is the most important part of the thing. And then I'll, I have to shut up. But this is really crucial to this discussion. So nine years. And you kind of, what you do is you kind of give up a little bit. Yeah. You, you say, I'm not going to whine about this anymore. But I'm not going to talk about it. But anymore. I'm not going to keep bringing, this is just old news. And I, here was my promise. Keeping promises, my heart no longer felt. I'm not feeling anything. But I promised you, I will trust you, and I'll wait. I trust you. Wait a minute, I thought it'd be seven weeks. Longer, longer. Ooh, this was awful. I promised. Do I have any integrity at all? I'm trusting, but I don't know. So I'm upstairs in this house, in this room, thinking, is there a Jesus? Did I borrow my idea of Jesus? Did I, and did I borrow it from Dieter Uchtdorf because I like him, or Boy Packer that I don't? Right, who, you know, you know, or, or who, you know, what, whatever it is. And I think I don't even, I, I, I know, he, I prayed, I, I promised I'd follow him. I don't know what he's like. So I'm upstairs nine years. My dad with the dementia has died, everything's there. And I have this experience. I don't leave that room for 10 days. I'm at my little piano. And I start writing songs. It's like these songs that I wanted to work on this overnight, and I'll see you in the morning. I didn't realize they were working for nine, nine years. years. You got it. In so, Church of Jesus. Is this in Church of Jesus? The Encountering Jesus album. So what happens is, it's like, it isn't exactly, but the closest you can get is people would come into the room who knew Jesus yeah. and would say, metaphorically, Oh, you're trying to figure out what Jesus was like? Well, I know him. I'll give you my take. Well, who are you? Well, I'm the money changer he kicked out of the temple. I got a take on that guy. It's this. And a song would come. Boy, that, that gives me a perspective on Jesus that I had never thought of. <laughs> boom, boom. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Next in the room, over the 10 days, is, a, is the little girl that, that was he nicknamed Talitha. She said, you know, he brought me back from the dead. I got a take on him. Song. And I'm writing like this. Oh, wait, 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 I'm next. I'm the leper that he cured. And he told me, don't tell anyone. anyone. Well, Mike, Mike, I'm going to hell because I'm telling everybody. I can't keep it in. And, and it news thing. But here's the most important part of the story. John the Baptist shows up. Now, don't get me wrong. John the Baptist the did not walk into the room. No, but I've had the same experience. My Mother Than Her Mother booklet and You Are More Than Enough, those covers show exactly what happened. And, and I had a blessing, and that's what happened. And people shared things that that's how the Spirit works because we're really all connected, right? So, yes, I get you. So it's John the Baptist saying, I understand, I understand Mike, you got a little uh, Issue. Uh, faith crisis. Yours is nothing compared to mine. And, and it's John the Baptist. I said, what, what? You, you had a faith, but he said, you haven't been paying attention in that New Testament. Right. He said, I was in prison. Yes. And I hadn't heard from Jesus. I wasn't going to be rescued. So I got two dear friends that were actually my disciples that followed him. Right. But then and, started following and I said, you go track him down. And you ask him, is he really the Messiah? Or should we look for somebody? And he's looking at me, and I said, well, wait a minute, I, I read that. And, I, of course, the, my New Testament is going through this as I'm meeting these people, and I'm reading it, and I'm also reading it. It's the, right there. Yes, it's right there. But the commentary in our tribe it's was, not. oh, no, uh, John the Baptist didn't have a crisis. He sent his disciples to strengthen their faith. And that's how we'll describe this, because we don't want to say that John the Baptist, who baptized Jesus, had a crisis of Herculean proportions. We don't want to say that. That's not how we'll interpret it. And so John says to me, I, and I say to John, kind of in my brain, well, wait a minute, I was always taught that that's how you help somebody else, but you didn't have, he said, who are you kidding? 
read it again. So I open up the scriptures, I'm reading the New Testament. Oh my gosh, John says, I baptized him, I heard God's voice, and then I start thinking, maybe I've been on the wrong course. And I'm, and I'm, I'm stunned by this. We're talking about John the Baptist, not just some other guy. What? So he says, I said, so what happens? This is reading the scriptures. And then the song starts to come. So I'm getting a song, and then halfway through the song, it's interrupted, and John said, so stop, stop, read what happened. The disciples go to Jesus, say, John wants to yes. know, are you the one who is to come, or should we look for somebody else? Right. Which means, are you the Messiah, or did I get it wrong? We're confused, yeah. Yeah. And Jesus says, what should we tell him, they say, because he's in prison, waiting right. to be executed. Yeah, which he is. Jesus doesn't listen. say anything. He just says, you've got a couple days, watch me. Watch me. Jesus then starts to do miracles, and then says, go tell them what you saw in the order that you saw them. That you saw. They go back to John. He's dying to know. What did he say? What did he say? He just, he, he didn't say much. He said he thinks you're great. You're the greatest man ever. But, but the thing he said was watch him and to tell you what we saw in the order we saw it. And they start to recount to John the Baptist in prison the miracles. And each one, John the Baptist has an aha. Wait a minute, I'm probably the only guy on the planet that would figure this code out. Another prophet named Isaiah 700 years ago said people are gonna say, how will we know him? How will we know who it is? And in those scriptures that John the Baptist was familiar with, that he was teaching from, he listed all the miracles in the scriptures in the order that John had just heard them. So, the prophet, John the Baptist, gets the answer to his prayer from Jesus in a way that only John the Baptist would get. It's so private, it's so personal, it's so perfect that it's almost unbelievable to him. And we skip over it. We, in, unless you've wrestled with those verses, no. you skip over that. So here's what happens. Big ending. Wrap it up. He, um, he gets the answer to his prayer, and the rest of my song comes. Blah, blah, blah. Wow, that's amazing. And then a couple more guys showed up, a couple more songs. And as I'm looking after nine years at all of this download of songs over ten days, whole album worth that was the Encountering Jesus song, whole Jesus album worth. Fabulous. So all of a sudden I realize that the answers to the deepest of my questions were in these songs. And then I thought, wait a minute. The prophet who has a faith crisis gets the answer in fulfilled prophecies. The songwriter having a faith crisis gets songs. And then I started to think, how is, wait a minute, wait a minute. This is so perfect. Nine years, and God sends me answers in a way that is so unique to me that only I would get these answers this way. This was my language. This was so personal. Yes. And then I had this moment where I thought, but wait a minute. You did for John the Baptist what was perfect for John the Baptist. You love me like you love John. You can't, I can't, I've got too many emotional issues and depression issues. I can't wrap my head around the fact that you could love me this much. And then, I was born again. And I started to feel this flood, not of songs, but of acceptance and of understanding and of love. And the pain of the nine years. Did I have every answer to it? No. Did I get it all figured out? No. Have I not had a single problem? No. But it didn't matter. Because your new foundation was love. And him. And John. And, and that, only him. And that he and that every day look to him. Not to the book, 
not to the five steps, not to the uh, presentation, not that they aren't valuable, not that they aren't great, but keep that eyes on Jesus. Eyes on the prize. So I'm doing that thank now you. the best I can. And thank you for being willing to share that. You could have journey, done this journey through the wilderness for nine years, which I think is significant, um, and not shared it publicly. Maybe your family would have known or your close friends, but I can feel the spirit today of the people you helped today. Mm. And, well, thanks for being and here. I'm grateful for your music and and your writing and your stories that have carried me through some hard times. Well, what I'm doing, which I just so you'll know, is an addendum. My kids have insisted that all of these stories, like we just shared, 45 albums worth of songs, nine musicals, all of them, we're putting it on a website called Songwriter Sunday School with Michael McClain. It launches this week, next week. Songwriter we hear, Sunday, heard it here first. Songwriter Sunday School with Michael McClain, where sometimes a song will teach us the truth, the only way our hearts can hear it. There's podcasts, there's videos, there's concert things. There's what's, we call it, what's new Wednesday. What's our new idea? What's the new thing? What's the deal? Da, 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 da. All on Songwriter Sunday School with Michael McClain, launching next week. It's a little subscription-based thing. And it's going to take me three years just to take all of the work. And put it there. So that every week we get new stuff, new ideas. And I'm not, I was too unable to receive the fact that maybe it could be a value to but it can. It is. So I'm going to make I mean, it. That's better. really to me what scriptures are. That's why I write the kind of books that I write. Because we tell faith promoting stories because it promotes our faith. Yeah. So when I hear your story now, you know, in my dark time, then I, I have something to pull. And it's not a checklist. It's like, wait, someone else walked ahead of me. You're not alone. And you're not alone. And really, that's really in our core. It's the fear that we're we're alone and that we're not sufficient yeah we're not enough that we're not enough thank you for helping um fight through and sharing that specific message today i felt the spirit of of thousands that that needed that reminder that whether it's a wrestle with parenting whether it's a wrestle with depression whether it's a wrestle with creating providing faith whatever that is that it's worth that wrestle and um, beautiful things come and most of us like the woman with the issue of blood, right? When is that ending, really? Like, we want it tied up in a bow so we can put it on the front of a magazine. And most of us are living a current issue of blood that doesn't have that little bow yet. Most of us, if not all of us, I think. Thanks, brother. Thank you for joining us today for this very special Winter of Worth Wednesday. I hope um, you will share this episode. And if uh, the Forgotten Perils is coming to your neighborhood, you may want to get there because there's some good stuff coming and a new way to connect with Michael on his songwriters Sunday school Sunday with Michael school. I love it and thank you again for joining us and we'll see you again next week on Women of Worth Wednesday thank you brother well that was way 